God makes a promise that this story has a fulfillment, that there's something coming, someone who is coming, a descendant of Eve who will stand up to the serpent and make war against him. It, it will challenge us, but it will also uplift us. Scripture is God speaking. It is God's path for his people. It is exciting to be starting a new year, to see new ministries, to see new leaders in the church, but also to start a new series uh, called Authentic Church, Authentic Church. And when we think about the word authentic, we might think about authenticity as the opposite of fakeness, right? We don't like fake people. We like authentic people. Um, And when I use the word authentic, when we talk about being an authentic church, Um, We don't necessarily mean it as something opposite of fake, but we might mean it as authenticity is different than something that's artificial. Let me explain. In January of 1994, in the San Fernando Valley, just outside of of L.A., uh, at 4.30 in the morning, there was a massive earthquake in the San Fernando Valley. And 20 minutes north of L.A., this earthquake happened, and it was really devastating. Uh, A lot of people were injured. Some people lost their lives. But there was a lot of buildings that were just destroyed. And during that earthquake in 1994, the power just went out. Well, being that it was 4.30 in the morning, a lot of people were still home or sleeping in bed, and they felt the earthquake, and they ran outside to see what was going on. And they ran outside, and after the earthquake was over, People began calling 911, but not about the earthquake. They began calling 911 about what they saw in the sky. They were terrified. They began calling 911 thinking that what they saw in the sky meant it was the end of the world. Some people even called 911 because they thought aliens were attacking. You know what they saw? The stars the moon, the the Milky Way galaxy. They just saw the sky as it always had been. See, the problem with living in a big city is you get something called light pollution, an artificial light. You know, we need all those street lights and stop lights and building lights, but what they do is they drown out what's really there in the night sky. And so once the power went out, everyone went outside and they had never seen the sky They'd never seen the authentic sky as it really was, and it terrified them. We live in this moment as the church where, you know, as the church, our outward presentation of things is important. Um, Our online connection is important. We, We have these things that have been around for the last 10 years that they have these screens and they... Once we unlock them, we get in and we can connect via social media and and connect to the world. And and during this time of COVID, during this moment, there's been a massive shift to some of these artificial things. There's been this massive shift to church online. There's been this massive shift to connecting with each other, not in person, but through Zoom. There's been this massive shift for churches to produce content to put out there for people so that they stay engaged. And it's not that those things are wrong. We have to do them. But they're not authentic. They're they're artificial. They're secondary to what the church is really supposed to be. See, like those people north of L.A., sometimes the, the, the lights of the city or the things that we do as a church can really hide what the authenticity of the church is about. And sometimes we can lose sight of something that we didn't even know was there. This series is really about turning down those artificial lights and focusing on what's authentic so that as the lights come back on, we know what church is really about. You know, you know those people that saw the night sky as it really was. The the lights eventually came on in their city, but they had that knowledge. There's something so much more beautiful and authentic up there. Even if we can't see it right now, we know what lights are really about. And so in this series, an authentic church, we're going to be talking about 
the church as community. What does it mean for us to be a community, an authentic community? We're going to be talking about how the church worships. What is worship really about? What does it mean to come together and sing praises to King Jesus? We're going to be talking about the Lord's Supper. What is that? What, what is authentically meant to happen in the Lord's Supper? And today we're going to be talking about Scripture. One of our values is being rooted in God's Word. But what does it mean for us to, to, to turn off all the artificial lights and see this book for what it's meant to be in our church? To, to see the beauty of it. To see how it's meant to shape us and, and influence us. Today we're going to be talking about Scripture as one of God's paths for his people in the authentic church. In just a moment, we're going we're gonna to watch a video, and Cody's going to come up after that and read Scripture. So let's go ahead and start the video. For those of us who follow Jesus, we have a book. It isn't a theology book. It isn't a rule book. This book is a story. The story of God and humanity. A story Jesus said he was fulfilling. This book contains poems, riddles, letters, puzzling narratives, and new ideas. Yet, throughout it all, this book is full of the breath of God. For those of us who follow Jesus, this book is a treasure. This book is a tree of life. This book is a page turner. Turn the page with us. Good morning again, church. Today, I have the privilege of reading God's word before you. And today's message comes from a variety of texts, beginning with Luke chapter 24, verse 27. We read, Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he, Jesus, interpreted for them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. Again, we read from 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 through 5. The Apostle Paul writes, For I passed on to you, as most important, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. The Apostle Paul also writes in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 through 17, All scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Also, Peter, in 2 Peter, chapter 1, verse 21, he writes, No prophecy ever came by the will of man. Instead, men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Also, Matthew, chapter 4, verses 1 through 4, he writes, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness, to be tempted by the devil. After he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Then the tempter approached him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. He answered, It is written, Man must not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Paul also writes in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 13, Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. Lastly, the author of Hebrews writes in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, For the word of God is living and effective and sharper than any double-edged sword, penetrating as far as the separation of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. 
This is the word of God. What's your big yes for 2021? What's the thing that you are really excited about and you're devoting a good portion of your life to? Maybe it's growth in your personal business. Maybe it's goals you have for your relationship. Maybe it's strategies that you have to improve your quality of life. Those are all good things. Uh, We want to see people's lives get better. We want to improve our relationships. We want to grow and have influence in our businesses. But let me put this out in front of you. Uh, What about a big yes for 2021 to knowing God more deeply through the scriptures? What about giving a big yes to knowing God more deeply through the scriptures? As a church, we are giving a big collective yes to that very thing, to knowing who God is from the words that he speaks to us in this book. And this morning, if you've made that commitment, I want to encourage you as you start off this journey this year. And if you're thinking about joining in, I want to nudge you to come on with us through this journey in the Scripture. Because Scripture is, first of all, God's story. Scripture is God's story. How does it start off? Genesis 1.1, in the beginning. That's the language of story. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God is the character in this true story of the world. Scripture is God's story, and it tells us who we are. We read that verse earlier, Genesis 1.27, our memory verse for the week. So God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them male and female. And, and the doctrine behind that, 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 that this scripture points us to, is called the Imago Dei, or the image of God. That, that every single person has dignity and worth. Black, brown, white, rich, poor, wealthy business owner, convict, homeless person, or, or, or upstanding citizen. Every person is created in the image of God and has dignity and worth. And because God's fingerprint is on them, they are beautiful. The story tells us who we are. But the story also tells us that we're not only beautiful, we are also broken creatures. We are like uh, people looking in a shattered mirror. We can see this image of who we were meant to be, yet it's not the way it's supposed to be. And the reason we're like that is because as we go through the Bible, we'll see very quickly Adam and Eve rebel against God. The one thing that he asks them not to do, not to eat of the tree of, of, of good and evil, of the knowledge of good and evil, they do. They eat from it. And immediately sin enters the world and it fractures everything. Immediately, everything's not the way it's supposed to be. Their relationship with God is broken. Their relationship with each other is fractured. Their relationship with themselves is now one of shame. Immediately, Adam and Eve, once they sin, they realize they're naked. They've never realized that before. And what do they do? They go and they hide. They hide from God. They hide their naked selves. They hide in shame. And what we learn from this story is really how we experience the world, that we are these creatures who are both beautiful, worthy of dignity and respect, but also broken. There's something about us that we just don't like, we're ashamed of, we want to hide. But thankfully, this isn't just a story that tells us about who we are, it tells us about who God is. It's God's story. And in this story, we find out that God is the creator But immediately after Adam and Eve sin, we also find that God is the Redeemer. God finds Adam and Eve hiding in their shame, and he confronts them with what they've done, but he immediately covers their nakedness. He covers their nakedness with animal skins because he is a restorer. He's a Redeemer. He's a reconciler. And then he banishes them from the garden. Now, the reason he banishes them from the garden is because... If they eat from the tree of life, they will live forever in sin and brokenness. So he actually, out of his love, pushes them out of the garden so that they can't eat the other tree and live forever in sin. Because God is a restorer, a reconciler, and a redeemer. 
But then we get this sniff almost of where the story's headed. Just three chapters in, we get this little glimpse of light of where this story's headed. In in Genesis 3.15, God pronounces the curse of sin on the world, but part of that is he judges the serpent, the Satan, the accuser. And the judgment is this, I will put hostility between you, serpent, and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. God is saying in this moment that there is a descendant coming, a descendant of Eve who will wage war on the serpent who led Adam and Eve into sin. In other words, this serpent doesn't just get to do whatever he wants to do. He doesn't continue, get to continue destroying God's world. God makes a promise that this story has a fulfillment, that there's something coming, someone who is coming, a descendant of Eve who will stand up to the serpent and make war against him. And that person is Jesus. That person is Jesus. Scripture is God's story that ultimately is pointing to Jesus. I mean, this this book that we have here has 66 different books. It was written over 1,500 years by 35 plus authors who were shepherds, who were prophets, who were priests, who were kings, who were tax collectors, who were fishermen and doctors and, and tent makers. But they're all pointing to one thing that's happening. They're all covering a history of God's plan to redeem through the one he talks about in this verse, Jesus. They're all pointing to the coming and work of Jesus, the Messiah, the one who was the descendant of Eve. In fact, Jesus acknowledges this himself. He he comes, he lives a perfect life, he dies the death on the cross that you and I deserve to die, but then, as he's put in the tomb and raised from the dead, he defeats sin and death and the devil. And as he's talking to his followers after his resurrection, he says this in Luke 24. Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, that's a way of saying Moses is the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Then the prophets are all the prophets that follow. Then beginning with Moses and the prophets, he, Jesus, interpreted for them the things concerning himself and all the scriptures. That is to say, this was the best Bible study ever because Jesus, face to face with his followers, said, this whole book is pointing to me. Now, Jesus isn't in every story. Sometimes we think of it as a metaphor about Jesus. I don't think that's the way to interpret the Bible. But all the stories are pointing to him. All the stories are leading to this heightened moment when the Savior would come. When you and I look back now and see through the life, death, resurrection of Jesus, the promise of Genesis 3.15 is fulfilled. In fact, Jesus is such an important part of the story that the Apostle Paul says it this way in 1 Corinthians. For I passed on to you as the most important what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the what? Scriptures. That he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the what? And that he appeared to Cephas then to the twelve. In other words, what Paul is saying is all the scriptures have pointed to this most important thing. The life, death, resurrection of Jesus. That's all where it's headed. This is the most important part of the story that you could realize. Scripture is God's story that's ultimately pointing to Jesus. But scripture is in and of itself God speaking. Scripture is God speaking to us so that you and I could know God and could know his character, and could know his plan for salvation, and could know what it meant to live the Christian life walking in the power of the Spirit. Because this book is God speaking. Paul says it this way to Timothy, a young pastor. He says, all scripture is inspired by God or breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. God has breathed out this book. It is him speaking. 
And as we journey through it, we'll find that he speaks into our doubts and into our depression. He'll breathe faith into us and show us what forgiveness is about. He'll speak into our fears and he'll speak into our greed. This book will tell us what love really is and show us what it means to live the Christian life. But oftentimes, it is difficult to hear God speak, isn't it? It's difficult to think that God is really speaking to us, to me, through this book. And and one of the reasons why is the artificial lights. Um, The things that are not necessarily bad, but they keep us from seeing what's really there. Uh, Sometimes our phones can be an incredible distraction. Have you ever tried to read your Bible on your phone, and for me, you get ESPN update after ESPN update, and they're like, oh, I'll, I'll scroll over real quick and just check that, then I'll come back to praying over the scripture, right? The, the, the phones can be an incredible distraction so that we never really get into depth, that we never really hear God speak through his word because we're so consumed by things that are, that are artificial. But not only that, the way that we read here is really different than the way that we read here. Jay Kim talks about how our phones are almost like slot machines because you, you pull it down like that and you refresh and you see what happens and then you get this little dopamine hit because something new has, has come up. And I, I found I can't even read the Bible on my phone anymore because I just get so distracted. Um, but it, it really has trained our minds to interact with Scripture differently than when we're trained just to he, read here, you know, sentence after sentence. And reading Scripture on here isn't bad. Don't hear me say it's bad. Please read your Bible, whether it's here or here. But something happens when we only read it there. Our minds get changed, right? Our minds get changed, and and for some reason, it's harder to read sections, right? It's easier just to read one verse at a time. In fact, you know, one of the things that's popular among churches that we do, so I'm not condemning this, on our social media page, we'll put out these beautiful pictures of scripture, right? And one word is like really beautifully highlighted. Uh, and, and that's great if you know the context and what's behind the verse. But if you're just getting that verse, you probably don't really know the context or what it's about, but you just see this pretty Bible verse and you're like, oh, it's, it's beautiful, you know? And, and then it doesn't really sink any deeper. It, it's comparable to this. Um, it'd be comparable to just watching part of the Star Wars movie saga for three minutes. You know Star Wars movies? There's three trilogies, there's three sets of three, so there's nine films, and now they're coming out with more, and then more shows in addition, so you have like maybe 14 or 15 films. And imagine just popping in and sort of watching a three minute section of that beautiful, beautiful saga, by the way, it's an amazing film, amazing films. But imagine popping in and just trying to watch three minutes of that and then coming away with something. Like you wouldn't know, you wouldn't know where you were or what it was about or like how it even applied to you. You know, there's this one scene in the movie Solo, which talks about Han Solo and his origins, and he's getting chased through Corellia uh, with this land speeder. The Star Wars fans are like, keep going, keep going. Everyone else is like, oh, this is boring. But listen, so he's getting chased with this speeder through Corellia. And if you were just to watch that one scene, you'd be like, wow, this is really cool. I have no idea what the context is. I have no idea what the broader picture is. And you might even say, I'm not even sure how this applies to me. Maybe this means I should drive my car like this on 95. And some of you do do that. We'll have to talk on that. But the, but the point is, you, you can't interact with a movie That's that beautiful and big and grand that way, and you can't interact with Scripture in a way where you just get a little, a piece without knowing what else it's connected to. One of the challenges with reading the Bible just in piecemeal is we only look for things that inspire us, and we only assume God is talking when we feel inspired. But all this is from God, whether it inspires us, whether it convicts us, whether it encourages us, whatever, whatever, however it, it does to us, it's all from God. Even those chapters in Leviticus that we're not really sure what to do with, and there's all those rules and things and crazy laws and things like that, that that's from God as well. And, and there's a way that we can interact with that and, and even see Jesus through it. In the early church, there was this guy named Marcion. Uh, Marcion lived from 85 AD to 160 AD after 
Jesus had resurrected and ascended into heaven. And as he interacted with the scriptures, he decided that a lot of it just didn't make sense to him. He couldn't reconcile the God of the Old Testament with the God of the New Testament. And he said, well, there must be two gods. And he began to slice and dice scripture and come up with his own Bible and actually write things that he wanted to be in the Bible. And these great church fathers, Tertullian from North Africa and Justin Martyr and Origen, these guys began to debate him because they said, you can't can't do that with scripture. You can't just make up stuff. You can't leave stuff out because then you're not really hearing God speak. You're just creating a God that makes sense to you. And that's one of the things that we have to be careful for in our own day and age, that we don't approach the Bible and go, well, only what inspires me and only what makes sense to me is God speaking. No, 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 the whole thing is God speaking. See, what happens is when we leave out a, a part of Scripture, bad things happen. During antebellum slavery, slave owners would not let slaves interact with books like Philemon that talks about a slave and his owner being equal. They would not let slaves, nor they themselves would not interact with things like the Imago Dei. Because what's the implication? You have to free your slaves. Everyone's created in the image of God. They would not allow God to speak into their reality. And we see things like that in our own world, but we also see this in, in how people are even coming up with new translations. There's a new translation that's come out that's called the Passion Translation. And it's not really a translation. Uh, when, when you come out with a translation, you get a group of scholars who come from various different backgrounds, and they sit down and they pray, and they go ev- over every word. And they go, God, lead us. As we know what the Greek says, we want to translate into English. As we understand the Hebrew, we want to translate into a way that, uh, <clears throat> that people can understand. Well, the Passion Translation didn't do that at all. It wasn't a team. It was one guy. And it was one guy who didn't interact with it academically. He just said, God, I want you to unveil the scriptures to me in a new way. In other words, he changed God's word and said it was from God. And if you look at this translation, it is really him imposing his views and changing God's word so that it's no longer God speaking, it's just him speaking. So if you have the Passion Translation, let me know. If that's the only Bible you have, I will buy you a new one. I will buy you a new one. I really will. We have to be careful uh, with things like this. We also have to be careful with devotionals. You have to really think about what you're interacting with. There's, There's many devotionals out there where at the beginning, if you read it, they'll say, God is speaking through me. You're like, well... Okay, maybe, but what about God speaking through this? What about God speaking clearly through this? Are you going to help me see what God has already said? Or are you going to change what God has said and say it's from God? We have to be careful because Scripture is the voice of God. In 2 Peter 1, Peter writes this. He said, no prophecy ever came by the will of man. Instead, Men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. In other words, you have this variety of authors who had the same God writing down holy words from God. Holy words from God. In fact, Jesus himself, when he's drawn into the wilderness and tempted by the devil, he doesn't make up something new to say to the devil. You know what he does? Jesus, who is the word of God, speaks God's word quoting God's word to the devil. He quotes Deuteronomy 8.3 and says in this story in Matthew 4, he says, uh, it is written, man must not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from what? The mouth of God. Now he's not saying that he's saying something new, even though he is God himself. He's quoting Deuteronomy 8. He knows his scripture. Jesus knows the Old Testament. He knows the Bible, and he knows that God has spoken, even though he is the word. Scripture is God speaking, but lastly, scripture is also God's path for God's people. You remember that quote from N.T. Wright last week when he said, the book that God meant us to have by the Spirit. The book God meant us to have by the Spirit. Scripture is God's path for his people, and we read it on our own. But we also read it in community. 
We read it in community. Paul wrote to Timothy and said this, Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation or to teaching. There was 1,500 years of Christianity before people had their own individual Bibles. And so Paul encourages the saints to just gather together and read Scripture. Now, that'd be hard for me because when when we talk about the Bible, I want to preach. But they just got together and just read the Bible. They read the Bible publicly to each other. Because the Bible, when we interact with it together, it forms us. It shapes us. It changes how we think. It changes what we love. Many people think that the Bible is archaic and outdated. It's ancient, but it's not archaic. It's highly sophisticated. Highly sophisticated piece of literature that comes from God himself. And it answers our questions, but it also questions us. So you read the Bible, but the Bible also reads you. The author of Hebrews said it this way, For the word of God is living and effective and sharper than any double-edged sword, penetrating as far as the separation of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. We bring our questions to the Bible, but often we walk away with the Bible questioning us. We read the Bible, but the Bible often reads us. About a year and a half ago, we did uh, the book of Jonah. And we went into that series going, what do we do with this whale? That was our big question, right? What do we do with this whale? By the end of the series, though, we were left with Jonah, the book of Jonah, asking us a really tough question. I don't know if you remember that, but the question that, that ends the book is, is, who deserves God's mercy? Jonah is sitting over the city of Nineveh, the arch enemies of Israel, and he cannot believe that God is being merciful to them. And we're left with this question, who deserves God's mercy? With no answer. We just walked out of that series with a question. And it was so timely because it was right the same weekend when the trial of Both and Jean had happened. Do you remember Both and Jean who was killed by the police officer? He was just sitting in his home doing nothing. And the police officer walked into his apartment, thinking it was her apartment, thought someone was robbing her, and she shot him. And we felt some kind of way about that. That was a tough thing to witness. But then in that trial, Both and Jean's younger brother publicly forgave that police officer. And everyone was in an uproar in all sorts of different ways. But that same Sunday was when we went through Jonah 4. And we were asked the question, Who deserves God's mercy? We didn't get an answer. All of us had to go out and wrestle with it for ourselves. Do I deserve God's mercy? Do they deserve God's mercy? Who deserves God's mercy? The point is this. Scripture is God's path for God's people because it is alive. And it will encourage us, but it will also cut us. It will challenge us, but it will also uplift us. Scripture is God speaking. It is God's path for his people. So this year in 2021, would you consider giving a big yes to reading through God's word in order to know him more deeply? God has given us this gift, and it is a dangerous gift. It's not safe to read through this book. It will change you. But it is God speaking to us. It is God speaking to us, but not just speaking to us, inviting us to be part of the story. Inviting us to be part of this story and to know him. And to know him through this beautiful, amazing